Let's see. So this is the outline of the course, of course, the desired outline. I have no idea if I will cover everything, but so I see I, I, I split in in four parts. So the first part is just some simple examples just to uh, to start, um, and then so I, I these two so these two sections will be the Pontrain maximum principle for a classical optimal control problem. So in Rn. You must know that we can do many of these things in, in more general manifolds, but that will not be my approach. Uh, and so I, separate, I, I split it in two parts. So the first one is with no terminal constraints and the other is with final constraints. I will explain later why there is a big separation among these two uh, approaches. And the, the last part is a contribution that we did with, with some colleagues of, of Padova. And it's about impulsive optimal controls, that it's a generalization of uh, classical optimal control problems. And in that part, it, we can say that it's a bit more geometrical. So we did an extension of the Pontrain maximum principle to higher order, and it involves some, let's say, some different perturbations of the control with Lie brackets and Lie algebras and, and things like that. So that will be like the third lesson of, of my course. Great. So let's see. Let's start with very, very simple examples, just to have the structure of a class of what I say a classical <laughs> optimal control problem is. So this fishing problem uh, from 74. So we have, uh, in general, we, we split the variables in like uh, state variables and control variables. And then though we can have additional like, parameters and algebraic variables, but uh, these are the more important, the most important ones. So we have here a, a problem of fishing. Simple, of course, let's see. So we have X would be the size of a fish population and that will depend on time. And at each time we will fish okay and so this will be our you will be our control we will decide how much we will fish how much effort we will put in fishing and the idea is to maximize the net revenue in a fixed time interval so we can model this way so let's see uh, how this model goes so first you have a term that is this r here so I don't have a mouse, but I can write. Okay, I don't have a mouse in the iPad. So this this will be the term of uh, reproduction and mortality at the same time. So R is the difference between reproduction and mortality rate. Okay, so then we will have if we multiply this by this term, we will have like x square multiplied by, by R over k. So there will be what is normally known in population dynamics as the mortality due to resource competition. So the more fishes there are, the, the mortality grows, okay? And grows, uh, it, it can be modeled as, as a growth that depends linearly on the size of the, of the population, right? And then we can fish, okay? So we can remove u of t, at uh, each time from the from the fish population. So I, I show this problem because it's simple to show, but also because it's still applied. I mean, it's control theory, optimal control theory is very applied to fishing problems like in every country. <laughs> so it's, it's a very applied problem and it's used to, let's say like to program um, such sustainable fishing in many countries and to decide public policies, of course. And then, so we have the cost, so we can, we, we sell the fish and we have to gain, and we have the cost of, of fishing. This is an interesting cost. So the cost has a, a term that depends, that is, uh, we divide on the size of the fish fish population, of course, what we want to express is that the more fishes are in the sea, the, 
cheaper is to fish them. Okay. Great. So that's a problem. So then we have, so I explained the cost, the dynamics, and then we have the constraints. Okay. So control constraints. So we have a maximal effort, a maximal fishing capacity at each time. And we want the population to stay non-negative. And in this case, we just choose to have, we, we decide that we have initial conditions that are given and final conditions that are free. Of course, we can also impose a, a final constraint in the in the fishing population that that will be very normal in in a case in a problem like this and put like put something like that okay but it doesn't change that much in this uh, example so I, there is a question i don't know if i i read it something appear here no no, okay, so the question is, <laughs> I read the answer. <laughs> Could in this model, the fish population grow arbitrarily big without fishing? No, if you take, that's a nice question. So that's, if, if you take the, the fishing, so I will do like this. Let's, let's erase a bit. I will write a lot the slides and then you won't understand anything. So if we remove the control, so this is the dynamics, okay? Uh, that's a logistic equation. So the, the maximum growth that, can, that we can achieve is, is K. So no, it's, it cannot grow arbitrarily. Okay, that's a, so there is a limit due to resources like food and everything. Great, let's go on. So this is another example, the Godard problem in one deep. So you can see there Godard in 1919 uh, wrote this problem for the, for the first time, stated, stated this problem. And we can say that, um, so this is about, uh, I have to say, this is about a rocket. So it's the dynamics of a spatial rocket. And this is like the most important problems in optimal control. So it's like uh, what gave importance to optimal control theory. By then, like in 1919, there were no so many theoretical uh, tools to treat optimal control problems that all the important tools appeared in the 50s, like contrary maximum principle and hamilton jacobi equation that you must have heard of. But already there was, okay, uh, due to spatial exploration, there was already a big interest to solve these problems, like uh, theoretically. So we have here a, a rocket in 1D. So we, we are interested in the altitude, speed, and mass. It's a simplified problem. So what do we have? We have three state variables, like the position that would be the altitude, that's H, the speed, V and the mass. So there is a variable mass because we have fuel consumption and that's relevant. It's very relevant in, in rocket dynamics. So the, the, the idea is that the, that the mass will change as we consume fuel. So these are the state variables and then we have the control variable U, U that will be the thrust. So we want to minimize fuel consumption, starting from a given position and finishing in a given altitude. This problem is normalized, so I avoid to put all the big constants, <laughs> constants everywhere. So we, the dynamics is like this. So the, of course, the derivative of the altitude will be the, the speed, the vertical speed then the derivative of the speed will have, we can split like in three components. So this is due to the gravitational field. This is the drag, okay, multiplied by the mass. Okay, the atmospheric drag, so the resistance. And then we have the action, our action, that is the control, the thrust. Okay, the, the acceleration that we give to the rocket. 
Finally, the mass will change proportionally to the to the thrust, and so the, there is uh, some coefficient there that is the field consumption coefficient, and we get the dynamic. Again, we have um, control constraints here and some initial final conditions. Okay, so that's another very classical problem in optimal control theory. So that's to start. So this is what I wanted. I wanted to arrive to a general um, structure. So let's see. So this is a formulation of a standard optimal control. So maybe I, I imagine that probably this is very easy for you, for, but I wanted to just to start like slowly. Um, uh, so this is the formulation of a standard optimal control problem, a quite, uh, let's say, complete formulation, but there are so many different types of constraints that, that you can add, but I will treat this problem, okay? So generally we have the cost that is split in two, an integral cost that is here and a final cost, terminal cost. So it can happen that the cost depends on the final time because sometimes many problems are just like minimizing the final time, like this optimal time problems that are very important. So it's good to put capital T that is the final time here and it can be free, okay, You're not fixed before. Then we have the dynamics, the initial state, constraints on the final state and final time and constraints on, on the control. To this, we can add, as I said before, several uh, constraints like constraints in the state, mixed constraints or constraints in intermediate points. So there is like uh, so many things, but I, I, will, I will only just speak a bit about state constraints because they are very important, of course, but I will not concentrate on, on the theory of state constraints. Okay, state constraints will be just to show something like we take the state, okay, that is x, as some function of, we, we can write them like this or directly like more generally like this, okay? Right, so in general, the control u for all this first part will be a function of L1. I say for all this, this part because then in the last part when I talk about impulsive problems, we can have uh, less regular things. And so the, the equation will be not considered in the classical sense. So, but I will leave that for Thursday. Then the state X is an absolutely continuous function. U is some set, some subset of Rn, M. In general, it is uh, a compact set. Great. So let's see. So we, in the examples, I show some terminal cost problems. So the idea is that you will see in the literature, these three types of problems, they have names. <laughs> Bolsa is the same, but you have the general, the most general cost where you put integral and terminal. Lagrange form is only integral and major form is only terminal cost. This is just to say to you that we can reduce the first two to the set, to the third so the idea is that we can pass from we, we can remove the integral cost and leave only the terminal cost that's the idea so i will treat all the problems i will write from now on will be with terminal cost that simplifies a bit the notation of course so what do we do to pass to remove the terminal cost the sorry the integral cost. So if we want to pass from Bolsa, I will change the color, maybe blue, from Bolsa to Mayer. So Mayer is only terminal. So what we do is we add a state constraint. It's easy, it's this is scalar state constraint whose derivative is the, the integral cost, okay? And whose initial state is initial value is zero. I forgot that in the slide. Okay, and then what we do is we change the cost to this. And that's enough. Why that's enough? Because of course, this will be the integral between zero and T of L of all the variables. 
Okay, so we, we will only write the, um, may, um, in the Maya form. Great. So now let's go to, that, that was the introduction. Let's go to the Pontrain Maximum Principle. Great. So the Pontrain Maximum Principle is a first order optimality condition. So we will take a pair of state and control that we know that is optimal in some sense. I will define in that sense. And if we know that that, is, that that pair is optimal, we will have a set of equations that that pair has to satisfy. That's the idea. Okay. So, as I said before, I will start with no final constraints. So I remove the final constraints and I, I keep this small problem Okay, only like an initial constraint, an initial condition here. It's in the Maya form, so only terminal cost, something simple. And for this problem, in the next slide, I will present the Pontrain maximum principle. Okay, so we have, just remember a bit the, the notation. So C is for the cost and F is for the dynamics. That's that's all the functions we have involved here. So before, before um, stating the Pontrain maximum principle, what I did, it's something like, I think, it, of course, it's simple, but just to say where it came from, more or less where it came from, but I will explain later that it's not exactly the same. So we all know we all need the calculus course, of course. So in calculus, like in the first year of the university, we had these problems that are the optimization in Rn. Okay, we have two functions, f and g, from Rm to R, to simplify notation and not put uh, indexes. And we define the Lagrangian, okay? So the Lagrangian is, we put the cost first, and then we put a multiplier and the function that express the constraints, okay? That's the way we define a Lagrangian. And uh, so if we take that Lagrangian, that Lagrangian and we want to apply the Lagrange multipliers method, so that is a necessary optimality condition. So what, what this method states is that if x0 zero, zero is an optimal for the problem that I wrote above, then there exists a multiplier, lambda zero, okay? So there is, a, let's say, I, I, I put a star here because these are row vectors. It, it's just, let's say, a, a, some people decide to, it's, okay, it's not. So the, the dual of Rn is usually, if we take our n as column vectors, that is the normal, the dual will be row vectors, but that's not important. It's just a detail of notation and convention. So if x0 is optimal of this simple problem in Rn, then there exists a multiplier such that these two equations hold that are normally called stationarity of the Lagrangian. Okay, Lagrangian is nicer like this. Great. So the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x is zero and with respect to lambda is zero, but this only gives, this gives only the constraints, so no new information, okay? And actually this is the information that we get that states that the gradient of f x zero is parallel to the gradient of g at x zero. So this is the important necessary condition. Great. So what does it have to do with the Pontrain maximum principle? So I, what I will do in the next slide is to formally apply the Lagrange multiplier method to deduce the adjoint, what, what is, to deduce the equation that the multiplier has to satisfy in the Pontrain maximum principle. That's the idea. So let's see. Okay, here. So we have 
we will change from black. So here the Lagrangian will be of this form. So we have two variables, x and u, and we will add a variable, like a multiplier variable. Okay, and we will define like this. So first we put the cost. We have the terminal cost in our optimal control problem, the one that was simplified, the last one I showed. And then we will have to put this, um, the constraint. So the multiplier multiplied by the constraint. But here we have a constraint for each time. Okay, so we will do that this scalar product. P of t will be our multiplier and we will put the rest here. Minus 50. Perfect. Okay. Great. So that's all the information of the problem. The cost here and the constraint here. Great. So and here P is a multiply. That is actually a function. Okay. Great. So if we what 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 was the Lagrange multipliers method saying that we have to do this derivative here with respect to x? So we can do that. We can do derivative with respect to x of l x u t in some direction set. This will give as a result, so we have to derivate the first term. The second, we have this form, so P will remain equal. I will remove the times, so it's shorter. So it's dx, f, evaluated in what we know, with respect to z minus, and then we have to derivate x dot with respect to z, but that's the variation exactly, so this is z dot. That's what we obtain. And then, so integrating by parts, My parts, what do we get? We get that that derivative. It's equal to, and then we will get like this. So this remains equal. We will integrate by parts the following. So to change color, I have to do like this. Okay, so it's this term that we will integrate by parts to remove the derivative from z and to pass it from to p. Okay, let's see. Nope. Great. So here we will get plus, uh, yes, p0, z0 minus pt, z. Okay, and then what remains in the integral will be this. See, plus all this multiply by z of t and the, the t that doesn't fit here. Okay, great. That's what we get, right? So we simplify a bit. So if since we have um, fixed initial state, so this is zero. Okay, so goodbye to that part. Goodbye. So then we will have this that we put together. Okay, and this information. Okay, so. What do we obtain from here? We will obtain the following. I will write in red, just the last result. C minus P of T. And then here we get P dxf plus P dot set dt, right. This is what we get, and we want this equal to zero. That's the idea.
okay, following formally the Lagrange multiplier rules. So here we will obtain two informations. This, the second one, will be the dynamics for the multiplier P. That's the idea. And this one will be the final condition. Okay, so formally from the Lagrange multiplier rules, we can derivate a, a differential equation for the multiplier. And that's the formation that Pontrain uses in, in its principle. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, here is the statement of the Pontrain maximum principle, of course, with no final constraints. So the statement is simpler than the other one. So imagine we have local optimality. I wrote here in a, in a simple way. So it's L1 optimality, like in a neighborhood of the control. That means that there exists, so there exists some epsilon such that, so the, the, this pair that we chose, X star, U star, is optimal among all the feasible pairs x u with u minus u star in L1 norm smaller than epsilon. Okay, smaller than epsilon. That's the idea. So we, we only need that kind of optimality. There are a lot of, like three we, that we can uh, recognize easily, three kind of, kinds of optimality in optimal control, okay? But this is the one that we need to state the maximum principle. So it's, it's a bit, uh, it's, it's not called weak optimality. This is normally called Pontrain optimality for obvious reasons. And because to make the difference with what is called strong optimality, that is only measure differences in the state. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't see the difference in the control. It only see the difference in the output. And that's very different of, of this, but. Okay, so what says the theorem? Now we will identify the quantities of the equation that I derivated formally before. <clears throat> so if u star is an optimal control, okay, in that, in the sense that I gave here, like in the L1, in L1 neighborhood, and x star is the associated trajectory, and p is the solution of this equation. So is the equation p dot equal to minus P dxf and what's called the transversality condition that is the final condition for P. So if P is the solution or, or is the solution of that boundary value problem, then this maximum condition holds. Okay. I will write in the next slide in a way that we can identify a Hamiltonian, of course. So, but is this quantity P uh, multiplied by f is maximized along the optimal control, is maximized among all the possible values of the control. So here omega is in u, u, just to remember, was the control constraint, okay? And omega appears here. So where the optimal control maximizes this quantity among all the possible con value, control values that we can take. That's the maximum principle. Great. So we can rewrite using Hamiltonians. Okay, so the correct way to call this quantity that I define here, that is H equal to P multiplied by F would be unmaximized Hamiltonian or pre-Hamiltonian. But in the community, it's completely established to call it Hamiltonian, even if it's not maximized. Or, but, and I, I will call it like that, so but please don't make confusions. Uh, okay, I know that for you would be natural to call it like pre-Hamiltonian or unmaximized, 
Right. So if we define that quantity, we can express the Pontrain maximum principle in a different way. Okay. So what Pontrain principle states is that if x well, if x star u star is an L1 local minimum, and p is the solution of the adjoint equation with transversality condition. Now the adjoint equation has a, this form. Okay. So it's p dot equal to minus the uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. Then, then the following maximization of the condition of the Hamiltonian holds. Okay, so the optimal control maximizes the Hamiltonian along all the possible controls, uh, control values. Okay, and that holds almost everywhere on the interval where the problem is stated. Right. Let's see. So I will talk a bit about the proof. Of course, I will not do the entire proof, but just to see how, how we, I, I, let me leave the, for a moment, the statement here until I find the proof here in my computer. Great, it's here. So just to see how, how we get from optimality to that maximum condition. That's, that's my idea, it's just to show, to show what ha what's happening behind the, the Pontrain maximum principle. Um, because it's also important for my last lesson where I will talk about impulsive problems and these uh, more geometric constructions for, for getting a higher order maximum principle. So let's go. So we want to prove, what do we want to prove? That L1 local optimality implies the maximum condition on the Hamiltonian. On H. Okay. That's our goal. Great. Okay, so how do we do that? So we start from L1 local optimality. That's the idea. And we, like, Quick, we can quickly observe something that's useful. So all these, the maximum principle are proved by doing perturbations of the control. So we know that the control is optimal. We change a bit some value of the control and we know that the obtained perturb control is non optimal It has either the same cost or a worse cost. That's the idea. So, we will take, so this will be our optimal control, um, sorry, trajectory control pair. Great. And we will take another family. So a family of X epsilon, U epsilon for x epsilon positive, that is a, a family of, of a feasible trajectory control pairs. Perfect. So if we have this, and, and it's not any family, uh, it approaches the optimal one, no? So we will have that u epsilon goes to u star when epsilon goes to zero. Okay, perfect. And this holds in L1, okay? Because we have to approach in the way that we know we have optimality. Great. So what do we get from, if we perturb like a bit, I say a bit because it's a small perturbation in L1, we, we perturb the, the optimal control. So what we then do, we want to use the information in the cost. So we take this. This is the cost. We have only terminal cost. Okay. And we compute the derivative. The derivative at zero from the right, of course, because we don't have no definition for epsilon, epsilon negative. So if we take this, so this will be, of course, the limit
over epsilon. Okay, here we're maximizing. So this cost for X star is bigger or equal to the other. So we cannot, we can show that we know that this is less or equal to zero. Okay. So that's the information we have. On the other hand, if we de derivate formally this uh, uh, quantity, so we have to do a derivation, we use the chain rule, we obtain first the gradient of C at X star of T, and then this. Okay, now, so we got this gradient. Okay, that's good news. Why it is good news? Because we can recognize this transversality condition. I will go a bit back, go back here. We recognize this. So that quantity is the cost state at the final value. So if P of T, Perfect. Okay. So this is the information we have from the optimality. Okay. So we have that this quantity is less or equal to zero. Okay. So actually, what does the Pontryan maximum principle do? Is is trying to try is constructing perturbations of the control, so to get a desired form for this variation. So actually, this is what we have. So all this, all this inequality, okay? That's the inequality we have. And the inequality we want is the following. We, we want to prove the following inequality. Let me the maximum condition that is like this. So I want to prove that zero is greater or equal that P of tau multiplied by F. Okay, but that holds for almost every tau in the interval and for all, for all u omega. Okay, we want to prove that. Okay, so I will not, I will not tell all the details. I think that with this slide and, and some next slides, I will just show the idea. So we have information in the final time, in the final time t. And we want to we want to prove some equality for almost every time tau. That's the idea. But what do they have in common? This quantity, this uh, inequalities that they all involve the co-state here, okay? And okay, some some quantity. So the idea is to create variations of the control. Okay, that give this derivative in the state, this derivative here. Okay, the one in the bottom. Okay, so we want to perturb the control in such a way that when we make the derivative of the state, we have this. Okay, great. So let's go to the next slide and then show to see because now what what I, we want to see is how to pass from some information in the final time to information in any time in the interval, okay? To do that, we use the variational equation and the action equation. So let's see these things. So the variational equation. So what is the variational equation? So we, we take the equation, the dynamics. And so we have the dynamics x star equal to f. T x star u. 
okay? And we linearize, basically. So we take the variational equation associated to that, that will be, will be, we'll have this form, this V of T equal to the derivative of F Okay, and with some, you write the variational equation in the interval tau t. So with initial, some initial condition y, okay? So that's the variational equation. What does the variational equation do in, in like in the general theory of OD? It's not for control, of course. Many people know because this is uh, the basic theorem in, in ODE, but okay, some of you certainly forgot. So what, what does this variational equation, what does the information that it gives? If we take, so imagine that we take a trajectory X star, okay, at some point tau, so the variation will be done in tau, and we add a vector. So we do small perturbation, okay? And then it's a perturbation in the direction of, of y, that is some vector, okay? And some smaller error that is smaller than, than epsilon, so it doesn't play a role, but just to see the generality. And we take this new initial condition, okay? We take a new initial condition that is perturb the perturbation of the original one in the direction of y. Great. So if we do that, then, then the solution of the variational equation with this initial condition, that is y, as I wrote here above, so the solution gives this information. So v at each time t will be equal to this. at each time t, the solution is exactly the variation of x epsilon, okay? So basically with the variation equation, we can like translate tangent vectors. So what does it mean? Imagine we have, so we have x zero here. We will do some uh, design, I will try a graph. Uh, and it finishes here, okay? We choose here some intermediate time. Great. And in that intermediate time, we change, we change the value, okay? We, in the direction, okay? The tangent direction to these changes is y, is the vector y. Imagine that that's tangent to this curve. You have to use your imagination. It's already hard to, to do uh, these graphics and with the tablet it's worse. Okay, so if that's why, and then we find all the trajectories, okay, for different epsilons, then and we draw the curve here at some intermediate point, okay? So with the variational equation, we can, we can transport this vector to this tangent vector. So the, this will be V of t, of t, like this. That's the idea of the variational equation, the, the use of, of it. Great. So, great. So we have the variational equation, as I said before, we have information in the final time. We want information in tau. We know how to translate these tangent vectors. So the last thing that I have to, I want to, I, I have to present is how we pass, how we, we do we, Prove that 
we keep the sign because at the at the final point the information that we have is this one Okay, this will be eventually the solution of a variational equation. Okay, but that's very easy because we have on the, on one side this. This is the Achon equation. The variational equation has this form. On the other hand, okay. But these are two linear equations that one it is the adjoint of the other one. It's very easy to show, it's just immediate checking, that the derivative of this product is equal to zero. It's just replacing the derivative. So this implies that P that this implies that T this function of t is constant. Perfect. So if that's constant, we can show that we keep the sign, we maintain the sign along the whole interval. So if we have this sign of the inequality at, at capital T, the last time, we will have the same sign in any intermediate point. Okay, so we will have the P of tau, V of tau will be less or equal zero. So what remains is just constructing perturbations of the control such that this V of tau is equal to what we want. Such that this is equal to what we want that was the difference between the F. And that's all, putting all together, we, we get the maximum principle. So the next slide is just, let me put, okay. Just to, it's, so, so that, that's the final point of the proof of the maximum principle, to construct variations such that this holds, okay? And this is done by the, what are called needle variations. So all, all the information that I write here is also in the slides. It's just that I want to construct better, better and to write while I'm talking. So the variations that do the work have this form. So we want, imagine that this is the optimal control. It's not usually continuous, but it's, it's uh, easier to uh, do this picture like this, do it continuous, and then we want to do a perturbation of the control around tau that do the, does do the work that we want. So we take a small interval and in, in this interval, we change the value of the control and we choose if we want the maximum condition for, if we want to prove the inequality for omega, some omega, then we do like this. This is omega. So the control u epsilon of t will be equal to u star of t if t is uh, in zero tau minus epsilon tau t or omega if is in. Okay, and these are what are usually called needle variations. Okay, so. What do we know that I will just write claim because I will not uh, talk about the proof of this because it's time is so I will have I only have eight minutes no Alvaro right. yeah that, that is correct yes <laughs> but don't worry yes, too much I, I mean if you want to if you want to go over like five minutes over or something like this it's okay too oh it's okay because I then I have five minutes to have lunch <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. I will try to end in time so people don't get tired. 
should say it. So the claim is the following. If we do the derivative of the corresponding trajectories, so this u epsilon have x epsilon assigned, uh, associated. If we do this derivative, then then we get we will give uh, sorry we get what we want so and this is tau everywhere tau tau omega minus tau sorry tau great okay so that's the claim it's it's actually I, I I don't think I have it. I, I do have it here. I prepared here, but I didn't want to lose time, waste time in this. But I, I will only just write one thing about this uh, claim. So let's see how I, I just want to briefly describe what I what we have done. So we want you to prove the L1 local optimality implies the maximum condition. Okay. The L1 local optimality gives us information in the final time, and we want information ar around the whole interval. Great. So, but then I presented the variation equation that gives information on the tangent vectors. So it uh, tr transport tangent vectors. And finally, well, we observe that this variation equation is actually the adjoint equation of the co-state equation. So the co-state equation is this linear equation. If we write the adjoint equation, that means that we transpose everywhere, okay? We get the variation equation. So that implies that the product is constant. This product P of uh, multiplied by V is constant. So if we had some sign in the, for that product in the final time, we can keep the sign in any in intermediate time. So the final point is to construct variations that give us this quantity that we wanted. So these needle variations that are small perturbations. So the important thing is that they are small perturbations in L1, okay? And so they do the work and uh, I will not, I, will, I was going to comment a bit on the claim, but this is not hard. I mean, the, the most important thing in that limit is the following. So we have, we will have a limit like this at some point. When we do the calculations of the derivative of the state, we will have a limit like this. So the idea, because we all know that the maximum principle holds for almost every tau, okay? For almost every time. Why for almost every? Because when we want to pass to the limit in this thing, <laughs> in this integral, there we are interesting, interested in the points where this, sorry, there is a mistake in the here. We want, we are interested in the points where we get this, okay? And this equality holds for almost every tau in zero t. In particular, it holds on some points of, uh, on, on almost every point of the interval that are called, usually called Lebesgue points. Okay, the definition of Lebesgue point, so a point is of Lebesgue, if and only if it verifies this, okay? And what uh, differ um, Lebesgue differentiation theorem states is that every L1 function has almost every point that is Lebesgue, okay? So that's why it doesn't hold for every tau, the maximum principle, it only holds where we have this enough regularity of the function. Basically, it will be of the control because the state doesn't have any problem, it's continuous, of the control and the function with respect to the time variable, okay? The regularity, it will it have to be enough regularity with respect to those two variables, okay? Great. 
so this is the summary of the proof, but I have already sp spoken about that like uh, orally. <laughs> and so let's see, I, I will not continue now, but let's see how we continue tomorrow. So I will show some examples to really apply the maximum principle because it's like this is very theoretical. So let's see, I want to show, I want to work out some small examples to see how from that action equation, we can really solve a problem. And then I will comment a bit on the linear quadratic regulator. So here it appears like great. Okay, the linear quadratic regulator is the most, let's say yes, the most basic optimal control problem. And I will show how the Fontaine maximum principle gives a direct uh, solution to the linear quadratic regulator. And finally, I will speak a bit about uh, numerical methods. So the Pontrain maximum principle um, can, the, the application of the Pontrain maximum principle can lead to a very used uh, applied uh, numerical method that I will show, I will try to show the main uh, features tomorrow. This is a, I actually work a bit on that subject on shooting method, uh, method and, and conversions of uh, numerical algorithm, algorithms related to optimal control. So the idea is that the first part of tomorrow will be to see that uh, it actually it's useful, the contrarian maximum principle. Okay. Um, so let's see, I will just pass. I put more material today because I didn't have an idea of the duration. These are the examples for tomorrow. So this is the bibliography of today. Now there is a delay. Okay, great. And the reference for today. Uh, I don't know if you're putting the slides now or just at the end. Just at the end, no? Uh, so to, to upload them to the web, you mean? Yes. This we can do whenever you want, basically. So oh, we, we okay. can upload these ones uh, today so people can see them maybe tonight. Or okay, like I, perfect. That would be a good idea. Okay, and that's all. So thank you for...